welcome to CPC in the Amstrad CPC video magazine where we take one month in the life of the amazing 8-bit Amstrad computers and take a thorough look at them. This month it's a new year rolling around, but the Amstrad CPC is still going strong. Now that it's firmly bedded in, it's obvious to everyone that the CPC is here for the long haul. 1985 is a year when many competitors on the crowded home computer market will fall away leaving just the big three, plus a couple of hangers-on from other companies such as Atari that want to maintain some kind of foothold in the market for future projects. The CPC had an excellent half year since its release, so let's get stuck straight in to see how it will face the rest of the 80s. As for us here at the magazine, we have a feature-packed future ahead of us, so we best get started. In this month's episode, we have all the news from January 1985. We'll take a look at all of this month's new releases, we'll catch up on all the software whose releases we missed in previous months, then it's time to check the charts for the start of the new year. We'll give the popular Maxam a proper look, then it's time to try out Pajama Rama to see if it was as good as people remember. Then we'll splatter our CPC with Splat, an odd arcade game that ported over very nicely from the Spectrum. We'll go up to the Beanstalk in our typing section. We'll take another look at a short Amstrad demo in our second type-in, and then we'll take a look at a rather nifty screen drawing and storage utility courtesy of Personal Computer News. And we'll end our blowout type-in section with a look at how command codes can be embedded in strings thanks to a nifty Galleon demo. Then it's time to have a good look at Computing with the Amstrad magazine. We'll review a Prelude to Chaos, a reasonably new game for the CPC that's ported over from the ZX Spectrum. We'll also take another look at a brand new game for 2018, Galactic 2. And we'll finish up the episode with some final thoughts. That's a lot to get through, so let's jump right into it. It's 1985 and the Amstrad CPC is entering its second year in great spirits. 200,000 units have already been sold according to Popular Computing Weekly, which is an amazing feat in just six months and at a time when the bubble is about to burst on the 8-bit home computer gold rush. The Big Black Machine of Destiny has topped Popular Computing Weekly's Reader's Poll for most exciting new computer of 1984, and I think we can all agree that the Court of Public Opinion was very definitely correct in this assessment. Good old Arnold, well done my lad. Unfortunately, Personal Computer News microcomputer sales charts still puts the CPC-464 in 4th place in its under £1,000 chart, where it trails behind the Acorn Electron. Not to worry though, because the Elk won't be around for much longer. The Electron is about to have its price slashed this month in Acorn's desperate attempt to shift over £40 million of unsold stock. That's £40 million in 1985 money. But it's not all good news for the Amstrad, because the 16-bit equivalent of the CPC, the Atari ST, has just stormed the Winter Consumer Electronics Show, making a mark that will eventually help to kill off the 8-bit home computer market. All is not lost yet, however, as the 8-bits will hold their own right up until the turn of the decade. Nevertheless, with the Amiga having already arrived, albeit in its original form rather than the all-devouring Amiga 500 incarnation, we can now safely say the stage is set for the next era, just as the frontrunners of the current ones are starting to properly settle in. Amstrad Computer User is now available on the high street. That's a massive step up for what essentially started as a newsletter for the Amstrad User Club. And it makes me wonder what user club members are actually getting as members' benefits now that Joe Public can just wander into a shop to buy the magazine without even joining. There's a new editor on board, Simon Rockman from Argos Specialist Publications. That's a branch of Argos Press, which perhaps explains how CPC 464 Computing Magazine has been able to get so pally with the official magazine. Rockman is taking over from William Pohl, whom viewers will remember was on damage control duties a couple of months ago thanks to that storm in a teacup in Popular Computing Weekly, which was caused because of the memory availability issues on CPC's CPM. That's a bit of a mouthful. Clearly running both Amsoft and 464 User Magazine will have been too much for one person, especially when the magazine will be going monthly very soon. So, Powell is now the managing editor as well as running Amsoft, with Rockman becoming the magazine's day-to-day -day editor. 
It seems the change in page size on ACU hasn't gone down well with every reader, and the magazine is trying to address that problem with the editorial for issue 3. Here, the editor tries to placate the Amstrad User Club members who are complaining that the new size magazines don't fit in their user club binders. A problem that I think we can all sympathise with. Apparently there will be other publications from Amsoft that will fit and those publications will be released at a discount for user club members. It's not a fantastic solution, but I think we can all see Amstrad's problem here, since the magazine can't stay A5 sized if it wants to compete on the high street store shelves, which is essential for keeping the Amstrad range of computers in the public's eye and thus ensuring the success of the machine. Still, it's probably something that the magazine's publishers should have thought about earlier, given that they were preparing the CPC-464 for success from the start. They were expecting the CPC to be a success, weren't they? There's an interesting letter in the 5th of January issue of Personal Computer News regarding the problem the CPC has with handling very large numbers properly when hexadecimals are printed. Upon the PCN, the CPC's use of 16-bit signed integers isn't all that well designed, since it uses the final bit, that's bit 15, to indicate whether a number is positive or negative. Apparently, any hexadecimal number larger than 32,767 will trigger the 15th bit in the register, and thus get marked as negative when using the print command. A simple workaround is to add 65,536 to all large numbers before printing them, as this will counteract the negative error and display the number properly. That's nicely spotted and nicely remedied personal computer news. Paul McCartney is apparently going to star in an Amstrad CPC version of his new film Give My Regards to Broad Street, according to CPC 464 user. It's being worked on by Argus Press Software and will eventually only be released on the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64, where it will fail to delight anyone. Did we dodge a bullet by having our version cancelled? I'll let you decide. Martin Fryer has won the second CPC 464 User Club software competition with his program Cop Robin. Apparently it's an arcade game, but I can't find a copy of it anywhere, so I can't say whether Amsoft released it at all. What I can say for sure, however, is that they did release one of the runners up, Electric Eddie. This is a Hangman clone that I remember being very fond of back when I was a kid, because it was amusing to choose a really complicated word for my sister to try to guess, which would inevitably result in poor old Eddie getting fried. Kids are weird, aren't they? Anyway, last but not least, the CPC-464 has now launched in Asia, arriving in Singapore in time for the Personal Computer 84 exhibition. Singapore is a major hub for distributing to neighbouring countries, so it makes perfect sense for the Amstrad to arrive there in order to make its way into other Asian markets. The CPC went down a storm at the convention, a feat that sounds amazing until you hear that the main competitors in the CPC's price range, that would be Auric and Sinclair, both pulled out of the convention at the last minute. Auric is on the verge of bankruptcy at this point in time, so their pulling out is understandable, but with Sinclair doing the same, it's starting to look like the writing is on the wall for Sir Clive's mighty Spectrum Empire. There's a book in Microfile, a popular basic program that gives you a decently powerful database. Apparently the program doesn't take the length of existing files into account when determining free memory space, so you can imagine that would be frustrating because handling large files is probably going to happen when you're running a decent sized small business or club, which is likely to be the target audience for the program. E.G. Shedden from Sudbury wrote a quick fix and sent it to Popular Computing Magazine, so now everyone can enjoy the program without a large file memory problem. Thanks, D.G. Speaking of books, there's one in the Amstrad's data coder. Doreen Cox of Dagenham has discovered that if you record a program from the ZX Spectrum onto a cassette, and then try to save over the top of that program using the Amstrad CPC, the Amstrad data coder won't fully wipe the Spectrum audio from the tape which will result in a 70% failure rate when loading your save back into the machine. Apparently the solution is to either properly wipe the cassette clean before using it on an Amstrad, or to just use fresh tapes instead of recycled ones. The Amsoft 12 pack has been announced. William Pohl, head of Amsoft, announced it in the 31st of January issue of Popular Computing Weekly. That doesn't mean it will arrive immediately, of course. It seems to have been rolled out sometime during the middle of 1985. 
Since uh, when my parents bought my first CPC-464 in May 85, the machine didn't come with the 12 pack. But I had a friend who got one just a few months later in the year, and theirs definitely did have that pack. There's been a lot of talk on the Amstrad CPC Facebook page recently about when exactly the 12 pack came out, and it seemed to have varied from region to region in the UK, and kind of roll out across the country. Let's hope that future episodes can pin the date of this famous software bundle down a little bit better, shall we? Finally, and we really do have to end the news on this because it's amazing, Alan Sugar has announced that Amstrad have four, count them, four new computers in the pipeline, including one that is a portable Amstrad CPC with a built-in disk drive. Is this a precursor to the NC100? Are some of the new computers forthcoming additions to the CPC line? Will any of them actually come to market? We'll have to wait and see. It's the first month after Christmas and software houses know the kids who just got a shiny new CPC 464 have a bit of money in their pockets. As a result, we have a plethora of titles to take a look at this month. Let's get stuck right in. First up we have Awful Awful Pirate Adventures with the CPC's mascot in Roland Ahoy from Amsoft. Oddball arcade game Quackerjack has arrived on the scene courtesy of Amsoft. The infamous educational title Animal Vegetable Mineral has finally arrived, also from Amsoft. Punchback is here, created by Ocean but distributed by Amsoft, another entry in what will be a long and successful relationship between Amstrad and Ocean that will continue well into the 90s. Space Hawks finally arrives, courtesy of Amsoft. This is a Galaxians clone and it's one of my favourite CPC games, so I can't recommend it enough. It's simple fun and I really do love it. Maze Combat game Astro Attack arrives, also courtesy of Amsoft. They really are churning out these programs at a rate of knots back at the start of the CPC era. And it's a shame that this game doesn't move at a rate of knots. It's written in basic and while it's very enjoyable, it does move rather slowly and it could do with being compiled rather than run in standard basic format, just to give it a bit of fun. Amsoft strikes again with Tennis Simulator Center Court. This is the first of three games released this month from publisher Epicsoft via Amsoft, and it's the first of three disappointments. This jerky mess claims to be tennis, but it's actually an uncontrollable farce that is outperformed by a Tiger LCD game. Avoid it at all costs. Then we have Detective, a game that's totally not Pluto. Oh yeah, definitely not. Really it isn't. Honest. Anirog brings us an interesting arcade game in The Survivor. It's bright, it has some lovely chunky graphics, and the music isn't bad either. I like it. Amsoft has unleashed the mighty power of Bridget upon us. How will we go? Then Amsoft followed it up with Classic Racing. When I first read the title, I have to admit, I was hoping this would be some kind of old-timey racing car game. But nope, it's a horse racing game. It's slow, it feels an awful lot like the computer is doing a vast amount of behind-the-scenes calculations between each input from the player, and overall, it's far too slow to be enjoyable, even if you're interested in horse racing. There are better options available, try one of those instead. Mutant Monty arrives on the Amstrad, courtesy of Amsoft once again. They really, really are churning these out, aren't they? It's time for some racism with Mr. Wong's Loopy Laundry, once again from Amsoft. Roland on the Run infects our systems this month, courtesy of Amsoft. Well, at least they tried, eh? They did try, didn't they? Good grief, this game is awful. It's graphically impressive for the time, well, kind of. But the gameplay involves lining up flashing men with pixel perfect accuracy in order to play a game of reverse frogger, and there's no satisfaction to it even if you do manage to get a guy across the busy road. Let's move on, quickly. Splat, a game that was previously on the ZX Spectrum, arrives via Amsoft. This is a weird arcade game that's actually really good fun. We'll have a proper look at this later in the episode. Software Star arrives. It's the follow-up to Football Manager, but this time you're running a software company, and it turns up via Addictive Games. Jarrell brings us another military simulator to follow hot on the heels of the brilliant Harrier attack. This time it's a turn of helicopters in Combat Links. Has Level 9 announced the Saga of Erica Viking arriving on the CPC? 
I'm not sure how we could have missed this classic adventure game, but it's here now though, and it's great. Amsoft graces us with yet another game, this time the intriguing graphic adventure Dragon's Gold. Originally from Romic, this game would feel right at home on an Atari 2600, and although it's not taxing the CPC in the slightest, it's still a lot of fun, even if it is a difficult little game. Notice something interesting on that loading screen now? Yeah, that's right. This is the first confirmed reference to the CPC-664 computer. Amazing that Amsoft let that one slip out, isn't it? Normally they're very protective of this stuff, unless of course the loading screen was changed later on, but that seems unlikely. Pitman Typing Tutor, which calls itself Pitman Typing Skills on the loading screen, because hey, what's a bit of continuity between friends, lets you learn to type on your CPC, courtesy of Amsoft. Stock Market, a stock market simulator that has a rather nifty look to it in my opinion, arrives via Amsoft, although it was originally an Argus Press title. Which leads us nicely over into the business side of things. Yes it does, don't argue. Camsoft brings us some business software this month, which is split up into a suite of packages, including sales, purchases and ledger software, a payroll utility, stock control software, and a database. Sadly, while the CPC Rules website has copies of adverts and even some photographs of a disk of the stock control software, copies of the actual software are not available online, so I can't show you any footage. Technically, this makes it a missing title, but since we have photos of the disk that the software is on, we know that it is out there, it's just not currently available, so I've not included it in the list of missing titles just yet. Amsoft is also jumping into the business software market with three new programs, all running under CPM. First, we have Microscript, a CPM-based word processor with a built-in calculator, because why not? And the ability to buffer long documents to disk, which is a rather useful way of keeping the machine running smoothly when memory gets low. Then there's MicroPen, a database which can work using multiple files at the same time. That sounds incredibly useful for many business operations. It also has a pretty decent search facility, which is always useful for a database. Finally, we have MicroSpread, which is a spreadsheet program but which CPC 464 user calls a worksheet because this is the middle of the 80s and nobody except the office accountant knows what a spreadsheet is yet. From what 464 user has to say about it, it sounds like a decent comprehensive spreadsheet. Well, for the time. But I'm always wary of CPC 464 users' reviews of Amsoft products because, as we all know by now, they thought Roland on the Run was a decent game. So, best take their reviews with a pinch of salt. All this business software just goes to show how much of an impact the Amstrad CPC has had on the small and medium sized business markets. The kind of markets where you need a computer to get ahead, but the big ticket PCs and mini computers are just far too expensive. As we said before on this show, the CPC was never just a home or games computer, it was always targeted with the business world in mind, and it very clearly hits its target for that. Moving back over to the game side of things, CRL has released Test Match, also known as Test Match Cricket. It's a cricket game, as you would expect. I'm sorry to say that I'm not a cricket fan, and I never learned the rules of the sport, so I can't really say whether it's a good rendition of the game or not, but what I played of it was actually quite fun even if it wasn't anywhere near pushing the CPC to its limits. Wargame Redcoats from MC Lothlorien also came out over the festive season. Well, probably. This one sneaked onto the games list from a few advertisers in Popular Computing Weekly, but never reached their new releases listings, as far as I can see. It's a decent tactical war simulator that I actually had a lot of fun with, so if you're into that kind of game, this one is worth giving a look. As for those listings, the same advertiser claims they will sell you any Roland Rat games for £7.60 however, so clearly they don't really know what they're talking about since Roland, the Amstrad CPC mascot, is not a rat. So take these adverts with a pinch of salt. But that isn't everything that's arrived on our beloved CPC. Kuma Computers are advertising at the front of ACU issue 3, and their advert shows a few new titles that I'm pretty sure we've missed in our roundup so far, so let's just list them all in the name of not forgetting anything. According to this advert of what Kuma has released, the ones that we've definitely mentioned before are Holdfast, which we covered in episode 2, Gems of Stratus, which we've definitely covered, Galaxia, a brilliant little game that we've mentioned in the past, 
logo, which was released last month, and we discussed it in episode 6, and Zen Assembler, which we mentioned a few episodes ago. But there are also others, so let's cover those. Music Composer. A program that typifies Kuma's brilliant cartoon covers, and they have so much character. Database. Easy VAT, or Easy VAT, which sadly is not available online, and Home Budget. Dean Software also brings us yet more business software with three programs of their own. Easy Data, a database program. Easy VAT, a VAT calculation and bookkeeping program. And an address book database utility called Dean Database Slash Mailing List. They also produced Music Composer, a music composition utility. If all this sounds like the same kind of software that Kuma computers are advertising, well, you're not alone in thinking that. Are these the same programs? Did Kuma act as the publisher for Dean Software? Well, the title screen to Music Composer from Kuma clearly shows Dean Software as the creator, so the answer seems to be yes. At some point, text adventure creator The Quill has arrived on the CPC, but I haven't seen any fanfare about it. It's been around on the spectrum for several months by this point, so perhaps I've just missed the point where the advert started to say that it was now also available on the CPC. Anyway, the pack of the inlay has a 1984 copyright marker on it, so it's likely to have either been released by now, or to be released very soon. We'll have to take a more in-depth look at this in a later episode, as it will become quite a feature in the adventure game scene. The CPC 464 user charts bring us more Amsoft titles that haven't been announced anywhere else, but which are apparently selling like hot cakes. The new titles in the chart are 3D Invaders, which is a fun but gimmicky game that doesn't quite live up to the brilliance of the original. Laser Wall, a really fun but sometimes frustrating single screen arcade shooter. The Galactic Plague, which so many people say is far too hard for its own good, but which I don't mind because once you know the patterns of the enemy's movement, it's all fine. Cubit, Crazy Golf, and Punchback Clone Punchy. Speaking of Amsoft, there's an advert in the 19th of December issue of Popular Computing Weekly that lists GP Driver as an available Amsoft game. I'm going to assume that this is Grom Pre Driver, but given that the advert also lists Electric Freddy and Gem Stratus as potential games, we could actually be talking about anything here. And finally, Hairsoft Micro put out a treasure hunt game with a prize called Hair Razor. The prize for solving both parts of the game, which appear to have been sold separately, was a golden statue of a hair worth about £30,000 at the time. The game sold poorly, nobody ever solved the puzzle, and Hairsoft Micro went into liquidation, with the hair being sold at auction for £31,900 by the company's liquidators in 1988. The original artist who created the hair, Kit Wilson, was later reunited with the hair for a documentary in 2009, following an appeal on Radio 4 for the current owner to come forward. We've also got a list of books that haven't yet been mentioned, so let's take a look at them. There's Ian Sinclair's Amstrad Computing with the CPC 464, published by Granada. Jim Gregory's Sensational Games for the Amstrad CPC 464, also published by Granada. Granada strikes a third time with Vince App's 40 Educational Games for the Amstrad CPC 464. Mark Harrison brings us the CPC 464 Advanced User's Guide, published by Sigma. The Amstrad CPC 464 Explored by John Braga from Kuma. This might surprise you, since they are a software house, but Amstrad CPC 464 User Magazine gave this very technical book a big thumbs up nevertheless. Machine Code for Beginners on the Amstrad by Steve Kramer comes to us courtesy of Micro Press, the same people who brought us Basic Programming on the Amstrad by Winford James just last episode. Andrew Bashara and Excalibur Publications published Mind-Bending Games for the Amstrad CPC 464 by Philip Laird. I have a feeling we've already covered this one, but all these books are starting to sound kind of the same to me, so I'm mentioning it here as well, in the hope that we will now have covered everything that has been released for the Amstrad CPC so far, and from now on, we can just concentrate solely on the new releases, rather than playing catch-up every time something that's already been released gets mentioned. We can but hope anyway. On the Road to Artificial Intelligence, Amstrad CPC 464, by Jeremy Vine, from Shiva Publishing. Is this the same Jeremy Vine that's now on BBC Radio? 
If you know the answer, let me know in the comments. David Lawrence and Simon Lane bring us The Working Amstrad, a library of practical subroutines and programs, courtesy of Sunshine Books. Oh, and just in case you fancy getting your funk on, there's also a body popping and breakdancing teach yourself book being advertised in Popular Computing Weekly. No, I don't know why either. Let's move on. All in all, that's a lot of books and a lot of software. When we mentioned the CPC's launch in Asia, the article in question referenced the fact that the CPC now has over 70 pieces of software published for it. I think we've demonstrated over these last seven episodes that the CPC has far more software than that. It's just not all available on store shelves. A lot of what we've mentioned here in this episode will be mail order, small press stuff it all counts toward the CPC community starting to come together and produce some really interesting, really varied software. The CPC has a bright future ahead of it, that is for certain. Oh, and as a final thought on an old game that we all thought was missing, I think I've finally found the Space Pilot game that Popular Computing mentioned as one of the earliest third-party titles released for the CPC. Here's an old advert from Anirog publishers of Flight Path 737 and the House of Usher. What's that in the corner of the advert? It's Space Pilot! So at least we now know where it's from, and that it wasn't a spelling error in the magazine, even if we can't actually find a copy of it to play. Did it ever actually get released on the CPC? When looking around online, the only copies I've seen of this are for sale on the Commodore 64, which is unusual because there's usually at least one copy of something being peddled by at least one eBay seller, even if it's just for a ridiculous price. Over the last few episodes, we've talked about months upon months of software that has been announced for the CPC. The majority of this is software that was published and we've been able to look at it. But some of it is software that was announced but which either never actually arrived or came out but nobody has made it available online. But there's a third kind of software as well. Software that was published but which nobody remembers, generally because it didn't come from a major software house and didn't have the fanfare of its rivals. I'm talking here about software that you would occasionally see a small ad for here and there in magazines. I want the show to be as comprehensive as possible when it comes to charting the Amstrad CPC, so instead of keeping going with the series and relegating the small press software to a feature sometime well down the road, I've instead decided to pause the series so that I could trawl through all of the back issues of the various computer magazines that I can find from the time. I'm sorry that this took a while, we are now about three months late in terms of publishing this episode, but I think I've now found all of the lost software that was only mentioned in these small press adverts. So, let's see what we've missed so far. A load of business and educational software from DCS in Stockport, including Database, WordPro, Invoices, Stock Control, Maths and Physics, and Amstrad Zip Loader, which sounds like a speed loading program, but I can't be certain. Frank Cooks has released a speed load utility, which is untitled in his advert, but apparently it allows the CPC to load software at 2000 board, and it will convert any existing software. I don't know whether that's true, but since he's trying to sell it for £6.50 in 1985 money, I really do hope it is true. I can't find a copy online, so that's another one for the missing programs list. Various dice games from Evolsoft, which issue two of 464 user magazine, says costs £11 in total, so I'm assuming that they were all released together in a bundle. Quantoon, another version, but this time with sound, from N. Atwood. David Computer Software put out a large selection of CPC programs and even a sound effects package, and his list of programs includes O-level maths and physics software, a typewriter program called Printer Package, a conversational utility called Arnold Answers Back, company management sim Entrepreneur, a Beans board game, I'm sure that means something to someone, called Bean Feast, a stock control program called, imaginatively, Stock Control, a word processor called Report Writer, database software Data Bank, a records and invoices utility called Invoice Control, an address book utility called Club Secretary, a book balancing program called Sundry Creditors, a basic software copying tool called Amstrad Unlocked Backup Copier, and 
a machine code monitor utility called Machine Code Monitor. That's a very prolific output for so early in the CPC's life, I think we can all agree. Several of these programs were reviewed in issue 3 of Amstrad's CPC 464 user, and they seem to go down rather well. Unfortunately, none of them seem to be available online. Solid Software released an early graphic adventure game with some arcade elements called House of Horrors. Gamesmanship are advertising a program called Johnny Reb, which I've heard of, but never played. And apparently I can't play it now either, since it's not available online. Pyramid have a Noughts and Crosses style puzzle game called Q4, another one I've never heard of before. Meanwhile, Steely Software are advertising a 3D maze game called Escape from Prince Pulverize, which I've never heard of or seen before, but now really, really want to play based on that title. They also have Walking Dog and the Bear, a text adventure, and Professional Pontoon available. So it looks like there's something for everyone in that world. Sadly, I can't say for sure though, because there are no copies available online. Then there's Fred's Progs by Fred. Apparently it's 33 useful utilities and 5 progs, all on a C60. Does that mean that the 5 progs aren't useful, or that they aren't utilities? Did anyone buy Fred's progs to find out? Let me know if you did, because I'd love to see what this stuff actually is. The advert has a cute drawing on it, and that's all I can say about it, since this stuff apparently didn't make it online. James Payton is back, this time as James Payton Software. We've already mentioned his 52nd Street game in a previous episode, but now he's here with Black Phoenix, an adventure game with 100 plus locations and many objects. Sadly, neither of these programs are available online, which is a real shame. What's really confusing though, is that Popular Computing Weekly listed Black Phoenix as being supplied by Gavin Barker. How odd. Montana brings us Backup Utility, a utility for backing up software. Again, this is a program that doesn't appear to be available online, which is a shame. Taskman brings us some additional programs that fans of Taskword will enjoy. First up is Taskprint, a program that allows you to print your files in a range of interesting fonts. Quite useful if you don't want to be limited to the standard dot matrix output. Then there's TaskCopy464, a screen printing program that lets you take a copy of whatever is on your screen and dump it straight to the printer. That would be very useful for anyone who needs a copy of their computer's screen output and needs it fast. Fanzine editors and computer magazines would no doubt find this quite useful. Well, providing you have the right printer that is. Both of these utilities are only compatible with a small range of options. Since we're discussing TaskPrint, it's worth noting that there's a very interesting quirk when using TaskPrint in conjunction with a disk drive. According to Graham Paterson, who wrote to Popular Computing Weekly, it's necessary to load with the load command, the font you want, and then save it to disk, which will apparently create a point down file. This can then be loaded in as a binary, and the address to load each font is different. See the scan that's on the screen now for details. You then need to follow the instructions in the manual to create a basic file for the font. Run the basic file, and it will load the DAT file, then run Taskway for you. To me, that seems a bit cumbersome, but I suppose the thing to remember is that you only have to do it once, and then it's all done and all ready for you whenever you want to use the various fonts. Skywave Software is selling their own version of Fig 4, with the promise that buyers will be able to upgrade to 483 when that becomes available. I can't find any copies of Skyway's Fig 4, but they did release an AMS 4th in 1984. I don't know if that's the same package, but then again I can't find their forthcoming 483 either. Is this missing software? Did it ever actually arrive? I don't know. If you know, leave your answers in the comment section. CP Software, haha, <laughs> I see what they did there, brought us Bridge Player, a bridge program, and Super Chess, a chess program. They were advertised in issue 3 of CPC 464 user as coming out in either December 84 or January 85. So we are right on time for these. According to the CPC Power website, Bridge Player arrived in 1984, while Super Chess was a 1985 program. Camel Micro strikes again. Not content with number 11 being a missing game, we now have Home Pack, a home budget and energy calculation utility, and CP Chess, but neither of these appear to be available online. Does anyone have copies to share with the community? Preservationists and CPC historians need to see this stuff. Viking Software brings us yet another word processor, this one called Vortext. 
plus a mini database system called Card Index, and a character generation tool called Character Builder. When I saw these three laid out in CPC 464 User Issue 3's list of available software, accompanied by the name of the publisher, I immediately thought of this stuff as being a software to run a Dungeons & Dragons campaign. I can't get away from that thought for these, so let's move on. P Sheriff brings us another database program, simply titled Database. I'm sure we've already mentioned Speedmaster, a program that lets you save your software at a higher board rate, so that it loads in quicker. Eversham Micro Center keep advertising it in Popular Computing Weekly, and apparently it runs at a range of speeds up to twice the usual rate, so that's pretty cool, or at least it would be if we could find it. LP Daily brings us a utility for printing price lists for a chip shop called Price List. Although why you would want this when you could just use a word processor is anyone's guess, each their own I suppose. And Burryman brings us a character set redefinition program that writes the basic code out for you, which is useful. I'm not convinced it's £4.50 worth of useful in 1984 money, but there you go. H&I Software have Screen Editor and Character Definer software. It seems like just about everyone was offering software like this back at the time, which makes me wonder why I had so much trouble getting some of this stuff when I was starting out in coding later in the decade. Interceptor Software brings us several adventure games that we just didn't know about, and an advert at the back of CPC 464 user issue 4. Along with that Forest of World End and Jewels of Babylon games, they also have Message from Andromeda and Heroes of Khan. Nice. Ubic Software released Paranoid Pete at some point around September 1984, but there are no copies online as far as I can see. It appears to be some kind of Weetabix themed arcade game based on the advert. On the business side of things, Quest International Computer Technology brings us business control program Amstrad Business Control, which appears to be an accounting, stock control and ledger program. It sounds very complex, but sadly, it's also a program that has not been archived online, so it could well be lost to time. If that wasn't enough, Gemini Marketing brings us even more business software with Database, a database program. Report Generator, which appears to be a mailing list editor, record editor and document writing tool that allows people to write effective reports by pulling in information from other programs, notably a database. It sounds a lot like they're doing stuff here that people would now not even think twice about doing in Microsoft Word, which shows just how far ahead of the times the CPC was. They also have a home accounting package called Home Accounts. Sadly, while Gemini software has been made available online, the cassette file copies that are available don't all work. And where they do work, it's not 100% reliable, so they have to be added to our missing releases list. It's a big shame. Does anyone have working copies of the software that could be made available to the wider community? But that's not all. Vail services have also launched some business programs for the Amstrad CPC. Their first is VAT Accounts, an accounting program that logs inputs and outputs, as well as exporting and or printing full records. Their second offering is Stock Control and Price Lists, which is a stock control utility, as you might expect, and it prints out formatted price lists. Lovely. Well, it would be if copies were available online anyway. Another one for the missing list. Last but not least, or maybe it is, I can't say, there are no copies. We have Cashbook from V. Tiverton. Well, I think that's what they're called. The scan of this particular issue of Popular Computing Weekly is not very clear. Based on the advert, it's a home accounting program. And that's all the missing software that we know of so far. From now on, I'll keep an eye out on all of the small ad sections from the magazines that we use, as well as trawling the regular sources of information for Amstrad CPC offerings. We should therefore be able to keep fully up to date with everything that came out for the CPC range this way. Now, let's move on because we've got some chart action to take a look at. The charts are all over the place this month, as you would expect in the weeks after Christmas, when everyone is buying up everything they can get their hands on with their lovely, lovely Christmas money. Because the charts keep changing week on week in Popular Computing Weekly, which I will be using for the charts until the Gallup charts start turning up regularly in the Amstrad magazines, I've decided that this month we should go with the chart from the 31st of January issue, as that was the final day in January and it makes sense to use this one in my head. So, this month we have, at number 10, the mighty codename Matt is still hanging in there. 
but here's a first for the show, because Roland on the Ropes is clinging on for dear life with just as many sails, which makes them joint 10th position. Roland in the Caves is still entrenched in 9th position, meanwhile Classic Adventure delves right into 8th place. Fantasia Diamond drops in at number 7, Blagger blags its way into 6th position, The Mighty Hunchback leaps into the charts at number 5, Football Manager started the year at number 1, as you might expect it would, given how popular it managed to be over the years, but by the end of January it has slipped a bit, and now it's sitting pretty at number 4. The Forest at World's End is still in the charts after all this time, in 3rd place. Manic Miner storms into the charts at number 2, and the brilliant Steve Davis Snooker retains its top spot for the second episode in a row. So that's the charts for January 1985. With Amsoft still dominating the top 10, it will be interesting to see how our first party publisher fares for the rest of the CPC's formative year. Anyone who's spent any time with their CPC outside of games will have come across at least one mention of Maxam, the famous assembler from Arnor. Maxam was one of, if not the, most popular assembly language package available for the CPC. It's what many games and other utilities were actually written in, so even if you've never seen or heard of it during the CPC era, you certainly would have used some of the things that were created with it. Maxam was available in both disk and ROM chip versions, with the ROM chip being the version of choice for anyone who was going to go and spend a huge amount of their time doing coding rather than coding as a hobby or side project. Today we'll be looking at the disk version however, since that's the version that doesn't require me to hunt down a ROM board or Maxam chip to plug into my CPC. There were two later versions of Maxam, version 1.5 which was available only on ROM and which removed the editor function, encouraging programmers to write their code in Arnold's ProText instead, and version 2.0 which was CPM only and added additional functions such as macros and code libraries. Since these later programs came out a few years after where we are right now in the CPC's life, we'll have to come back and look at them at a later date, but for now we'll stick with the original version. So let's take a look at Maxam. It comes in three parts, the assembler, the monitor and the text editor. The manual makes it clear that this text editor can also be used to write letters and reports, so it sounds like we could use something else just to write our code if we fancied it. Fans of Amsword and Tasword should be right at home then. The manual is comprehensive and lays out a guide to the assembler that anyone who is already familiar with DevPack will be right at home using. This is very much a different flavour of the same product as DevPack, so at the end of the day it will all be down to your preferences when deciding what to use if you choose to program an assembly language on the CPC. The first program in the manual introduces the basic methods of writing code in Maxam, and also gives some very good advice. Always include the instructions for assembling your code in the code itself. This is very good advice because if you come back to a program at a later date, you don't then have to try and remember or dig around in the code to figure out the best variables that you'll need to compile the code. It's also interesting to note that the assembler code is an awful lot longer than its basic alternative when it comes to accomplishing everyday tasks. This is, of course, because BASIC is a scripting language and condenses a lot of instructions into simple mnemonics that have to be decompressed and compiled on the fly. With Maxam, as with all assemblers, you have full control over every aspect of the CPC, so the code has to be longer and more precise. Naturally, Maxam is much faster as a result. It's worth noting that Maxam, as with many other languages, allows the use of comments in the code. Comments in Maxam appear after semicolons, which mark the end of commands on each line of code, although I have to note you don't actually have to use semicolons unless you're actually wanting to put a comment on the end of that line. Text written after a semicolon can be read by anyone who looks at the code, but won't impact the compiling and execution of the code in any way because the CPC will ignore them. As always, that's useful to remember because it means you can leave explanations for yourself about how the code works and why the code is written the way it is. Personally, I find that I benefit greatly from leaving comments in my code because I can guarantee that if I have to debug or extend it later, I won't have a clue how any of it works. Maxam uses, or at least appears to use, the same machine code commands as DevPack, which you might expect. It also means switching from one to the other is very simple. Commands are written out one at a time, one per line, which means coding is clean and simple to read. 
the interface is also very easy to use. It took me no time at all to get to grips with the text editor, exiting from the editor back to the menus was as easy as pressing the escape key, and although the code that I wrote on my first time out was riddled with bugs, because hey, whose isn't, I was able to assemble it with one keystroke from the menu, which made it a very quick and very simple task. So, if you're into assembler coding, or if you're just interested in getting started in assembler, then Maxam is definitely one of the programs to try. For most people, it's a case of either getting to grips with this, or getting to grips with DevPack, and only you can decide which better suits you. Happy coding! Pajamarama is one of those games that people rave about, but which I have to admit I'm not a big fan of. It's the first outing of Wally Week, a character who would go on to star in several graphic adventure games, including one of my personal favourites, Everyone's a Wally. In his first adventure, however, he's coming to us directly from the ZX Spectrum, and it shows. The music is typical beeper music, not pushing the CPC's sound chip to any real degree, and actually sounding very annoying right from the start. The colours in the game are really bright, but everything is big, flat colours, which works fine for something like Dizzy, but really looks quite garish for Wally. I think it's the big, chunky sprites that are making the difference between the two games. This just screams quick, specky port, which, let's be fair, it probably is. Gameplay-wise, it's your typical graphic adventure fair. You pick up items to use in various places in order to solve puzzles and progress through the game. In that respect, the game works nicely. I do have a problem with the fact that you can change what you are carrying by just walking over items rather than selecting them to pick up, because it's far too easy to accidentally drop an item that you want in favour of one that you don't just by accidentally walking over it while avoiding an enemy. But aside from that minor gripe, it's a decent enough graphic adventure with pretty decent controls. The enemies move quickly and Wally moves reasonably fast too, so everything is nice in that respect. The game doesn't chug along and it's rather a pleasure to play while you're playing it. The issues all come from the presentation of the game, if truth be told. Had this been tweaked to take advantage of the advancements of the CPC over the spectrum, then it would have been a very nice game that I would have been happy to recommend. As it stands though, it's a standard graphic adventure game without any polish. One for the fans of the genre. As arcade games go, the best ones are always the simplest, and Splat is definitely one of the best ones. At its heart, it's a simple maze game, where you're expected to collect items for points while attempting to get to the end of a level. But the twist here is that the maze moves, and the border is deadly. You control Zippy, a weird frog-like creature that eats grass. Your goal is to get Zippy to the exit on maze 8, which is easier said than done because the maze moves quickly and it will change direction at random. Zippy moves quickly, probably a little bit too quickly if I'm honest. He zips around the screen, hence his name, and at times it seems like he's almost uncontrollable, which makes the game a little harder than it otherwise would be because it's very easy to rush head first into the border. Conversely, the maze moves in character blocks, which gives the game a jerky feel. I don't know whether this is because there's a lot to move around in the game and the CPC isn't all that great with smooth scrolling, although it can be done if you know what you're doing, or whether the contrast between the jerky maze motion and the smoothness of Zippy is intentional to give the game a weird feeling. Either way, the game has a distinct feel to it, one that's both easy to get drawn into and also a little, well, off. It's fun, it's fast paced, and it always keeps you on your toes because the direction the maze scrolls in shifts without warning. It's a decidedly simple game, but it's fiendishly difficult as well, which means you'll be coming back for more for a long time after you start to play. I definitely recommend giving this one a go. Puzzle and maze game fans will love it. Jack and the Beanstalk, as the game calls itself, although issue 3 of Amstrad Computer User titled the listing as Up the Beanstalk, because continuity doesn't seem to have been popular in 1985. Anyway, Jack and the Beanstalk is a short text adventure game that covers three pages of dense text in what ACU described as a bumper games bundle for those with agile fingers, although I think modern audiences would be more likely to describe it as a strenuous eye test for people who don't mind trying to decipher dense black text 
from a bright yellow sheet of paper. ACU's colour scheme is atrocious in the early issues, it really is. Anyway, the game is a text adventure game from Steve Lucas, who came close to winning the second ACU £2,000 game contest, so well done Steve! The game revolves around Jack, who is an unemployed young man constantly being berated by his mother to get a job. He decides that the best way to get her off his back is to find where the local ogre lives and steal all of the ogre's money, because apparently crime is acceptable in this world as long as the ogre has already stolen the money from someone else. Two wrongs don't make a right, Jack. Anyway, the game is presented in classic early CPC style, multicolored text on a traditional Amstrad blue background. It looks good and it's easy to read. CPC text adventure fans will feel right at home with this one, so let's jump right in and see how the game plays. At its heart, this is a fun game. The puzzles are decent enough, the writing is fun, and everything works as you would expect for an early type-in game. I don't like the fact that the game bleeps every time you enter a command, that got old really quickly, but you can turn that off by editing the appropriate line in the game code, because this is a type-in after all. Which line of code do you need to change? Well, that is the problem that I have with this listing. It's dense, really dense. I couldn't find the code on my first try, even though the magazine has a comprehensive list of what each section of the game code is for. Is it in the main game loop? One of the various subroutines to handle the various commands? Maybe it's in the section for calling for the next player input. Just trying to scan the lines of code in the magazine didn't make any of that clear, because it's a right pain in the backside to read when it's dense black text on a bright yellow background. But let's face it, when the only gripe you have about the game is the fact that it's making a noise and you could really just turn the sound down to get rid of it, I think we are onto a winner here. Jack and the Beanstalk is a big, sturdy adventure game that comes in at 20k of basic code when it's saved to disc. It's chunky. It's well presented, and I had a lot of fun with it, I have to admit. Text adventure fans will have a lot of fun with this one, and fans of making their own text adventure games could do a lot worse than take a look at this one, because the way it's laid out in code form is really nice. Everything is compartmentalised. The code for determining how the player's inputs are handled all runs smoothly together. The various data lines are simple to read, which means that it would be very easy to expand this game with new puzzles and new locations if you want to and it wouldn't be a big issue to add in new descriptions for all the items in the game if you fancied that as well. I dare say, more than a few bedroom coders took the method and style of this game's code and used it as a basis for constructing their own adventure games. It's just that well written, which is why I am not in the slightest bit surprised that the game came second in the £2,000 prize contest. It just is a really good game. So, as I said earlier, well done Steve Lucas. You've made a brilliant game here with a fantastic type in. This short type-in, which clocks in at just 34 lines of code, is another basic demo that animates the screen. But this one goes one step further than what we've seen so far with this kind of demo. Author Peter Bowers opts to use the 16 colour mode 0 as his canvas for this particular animation, which allows for a far smoother animation than we've seen in previous examples. If you recall the Trench Run demo from episode 6, and the Woman in the Shower demo from episode 2, those used modes 1 and 2 respectively, which limited their colour palettes quite substantially. That's a big problem for these demos, because the animation is achieved through colour switching, rather than redrawing the screen, so the fewer colours you have available, the fewer frames of animation you can achieve. The colour switching is managed through two 4 next loops from lines 230 to 300. The first loop scrolls the stars on the screen by turning all the inks black except for one, which it turns white, and then cycling through which ink is white in turn. The second loop does the same thing, only in the opposite direction. The result is a very smooth 16 frame animation, as you would expect when the CPC doesn't actually have to move anything around on screen. Peter submitted this to Your Computer Magazine, and it was published in June 1986, making it from the future in terms of where we are in the CPC's lifespan, but I thought we would add it in here because it follows on from the progression of animations that we've seen so far. Also, he posted about it on the Amstrad CPC 464 Facebook group while I was finishing off the script for this episode, so it just fell out. For such a small typing that's handled entirely in basic, it is a very nice demo. Well done, Peter!
the ability to draw an image and then store that image to redraw it later is very useful when either making art on your CPC or adding graphics to games, such as putting an image into a text adventure game. That's where this nice little utility from the 5th of January 1985 issue of Personal Computer News can come in handy. Draw Utility, as the listing calls itself, is a dense piece of coding created by John Keneally and it comes in two sections, a program for drawing pictures and a program for loading them into memory and then redrawing them onto the screen. Mr Keneally states in the code that this second program can be incorporated into your own software, which means text adventure writers can have their own graphics added to their games. Very useful, I think you'll agree. As I said, the code in this type-in is dense. I lost track of the amount of times that I lost track of what I was telling the CPC to do while I was trying to type this thing in. It uses a lot of trigonometric functions, integrations, extensive use of the draw and move commands, as you would expect in a graphics listing, and commands like that. Some of this is what you would find in many other programs, while the rest is not. What is interesting is how small the listing is for what it's doing, which is a testament to how densely packed the code is. On line 260, you can see a list of what appears to be gibberish, followed by a long line of go-to commands. The gibberish is literally every single instruction that you can issue to the program, instead of having a line for each instruction with a corresponding go-to command to tell the CPC what to do if that key is pressed, which is how the arrow keys for cursor movement are handled, Mr Keneally has instead decided to use the insta or in string command. Insta is a clever little instruction that allows you to search for a particular string inside another string. By combining all the instruction keys into one long string, he demonstrates that you can then use one line of code to send the CPC off to whichever portion of the program you need it to go to when it finds that a key is pressed. Earlier in the program, a string was defined as the string holding the latest key press and the insta command will stop at the first instance of whatever is being searched for, so by using insta with a string, the CPC is told to start searching all the way through that line of possible commands and then to go to a load of subroutines in the code to execute a command so long as the key that was pressed corresponds to one of the program's commands. If it doesn't, the key press will be ignored because a string won't be found inside that list of commands using the insta command. That's a really cool trick and it cuts down on a lot of memory use. The drawing program itself is pretty fast and very easy to get to grips with. It's all down to drawing lines and curves on the screen. You can select a position on the screen to start a line or a curve, then select another position on the screen to end that line or curve. Then you are asked for the angle of the curve enter zero for a straight line. That's pretty much it. The only odd feature I found was the way that it uses a partial infill command. It doesn't operate the way you would expect, certainly not the way that the fill command in basic 1.1 works for example. It doesn't fill in an area like a modern paint program would. Instead, it draws a curve from the point where your cursor is back to the last point you selected for drawing. This takes a bit of getting used to, and it also means trying to infill an area can take an awful lot of time, but at the same time, it means that you'll get very accurate infilling if you handle it right. All in all, I'm really impressed by this program, and I'll be uploading the type-in as a DSK file to the CPC wiki. It should be on the site by the time you see this episode. If I told a younger version of me that it was possible to embed command codes into print commands, I would not have believed me. I would also be amazed at my ability to time travel of course, but that is a conversation for another time. Modern computer users will be well aware of the standard hacking technique whereby commands are hidden inside data requests and other strings which are then run by the computer receiving the strings even though that's not really supposed to happen. As it turns out, the Amstrad CPC has a similar security flaw because you can very definitely hide command codes inside strings. In the 12th of January 1985 issue of Personal Computer News, we have this security flaw run in a fun way, printing a multi-line sprite of a galleon on screen using a single line of code. The way this works is the inclusion of multiple strings and character string commands within a string of text to be printed onto the screen. These commands carry instructions to move the cursor and print in different colours which the CPC is interpreting as it goes along. 
The string is set up across multiple lines of code, which makes it easier for us to interpret what's going on here. Lines 110, 120 and 130 all set up the string, while the string itself is printed on both lines 140 and then again on line 150, which allows the galleon to move on screen. Line 140 moves the galleon from left to right on the screen, while line 150 moves the galleon from right to left. Then the movement starts again. Now, I'll admit that the movement is a little bit jerky and the graphics flash while the screen is being redrawn, but we can excuse all of that because smooth scrolling and non-flashing graphics aren't what this is all about. What we're interested in here is the fact that at no point have we typed a pen command to change the colours, yet look at what we have on screen. Multiple colours on the galleon, plus the previous position of the galleon, is being overwritten. That is amazing. How this works appears to be all down to the use of the string command embedded into the variable being printed to the screen. This is the only code that isn't one of the characters that we defined in lines 40 to 100 using the symbol command. Those symbol commands only set up what the galleon we print to screen will look like. They create the shape of the sails, the shape of the ship, the cross printed on the sails and so forth. Everything else is handled by the string commands, which are sending codes to the print command to change colour. So what does this mean for basic programming? Well, aside from the obvious that you can change colours on the fly without interrupting the position of the cursor, it also means that you could use the string command in this way to produce secret information in your type ends. If we combine this tool with the adventure game code for Jack and the Beanstalk earlier in the episode, the possibilities are actually endless. Not only could you quickly get a lot of colour change code printed to the screen and thus cut down the length of your type in for that game, but you could also have characters and enemies in the game react in ways that the player does not expect. That's very useful, because the player will likely have just finished typing in the game, and thus will have seen all the mechanics for the game as well as all of the expected NPC responses. You could then throw them a curveball using this particular technique. It's actually quite a valuable coding trick in many ways, as well as being a decent example of early CPC animation, and I think that's been well worth giving a try. When I first bought the CPC 464-6128 hybrid that I now use for this video magazine show, it came with a bundle of old print magazines. They were all magazines the previous owner, because this machine was secondhand, had bought while they had been using the CPC as their main computer. Amongst the magazines were a number of issues of computing with the Amstrad magazine, which had ceased publication two years before I bought the machine. Computing with the Amstrad was one of those magazines that had no actual reason to exist. It brought nothing new to the table in comparison with its competitors, but it was one that I was glad existed nevertheless. It wasn't quite as technical as Amstrad Computer User, but it wasn't quite as games oriented as Amstix, which it later merged with. It was presented in a more jovial, down-to-earth manner than ACU, but it wasn't anywhere near as zany and off-the-wall as Amstrad Action. It occupied the middle ground in pretty much every respect, and that's probably one of the reasons why it only lasted for four years. It's the magazine that it's easy to forget about, which is sad in a way, because its content was decent enough. During its short run, Computing with the Amstrad brought us a number of fun type-ins, including its famous 10-liner type-ins, programs that had to fit within only 10 lines of code, which made them quick to input for readers. As a child, I really appreciated this, because it meant less wrangling with line after line of data strings, followed by potentially hours of debugging. 10 liners got right to the point. There were also a number of technical articles that I remember skipping over back when I first read the magazine as a 10 year old, but which I later came back to as a far more mature 12 year old, eager to learn more about the machine and how to make the most of my beloved Amstrad. Again, these technical articles embodied the main issue with computing with the Amstrad. They weren't quite as technical as Amstrad Computer User, and were more on a par with what you'd find in Amstrad Action. And I had already read all the techie articles in Amstrad Action, so these weren't really bringing much new to the table. Computing with the Amstrad tried to cover the whole gamut of Amstrad computers, which became quite a problem from my point of view during its second year, because all the coverage of the Amstrad PCW was no use to my CPC owning self. When the PCW side split off into its own magazine, the original magazine became Computing with the Abstract CPC. A bit of a mouthful for sure, but definitely more focused. Having all the articles being about the machine that you own is definitely more of a selling point. Sadly, it wasn't enough to keep the magazine going. 
Around the time the PCW stuff split off into a separate magazine, Amtix merged into Computing with the Amstrad. This merger lasted for 16 issues, after which the magazine rebranded once more, becoming CPC Computing. This is, of course, long after CPC 464 Computing Magazine had also rebranded as CPC Computing, but since that magazine was long dead at this point, there really was no real risk of confusion. The new CPC Computing Magazine lasted for only four issues, before CPC Computing was absorbed into the official magazine Amstrad Computer User, then ACU, which is something that I still find weird, because they weren't even owned by the same publisher. We will have to look into what was going on there in a later episode, because this has to be a story worth telling. Overall, Computing with the Amstrad was a pretty solid all-rounder magazine that just didn't have a specific selling point that could put it above the competition. Like I said earlier, I enjoyed their type-ins, especially the 10-liners, and I also remember their text adventure section being really good, but that's pretty much all that stood out for it. Coming up to the modern day, it's a real shame that this magazine hasn't been archived online. Even when CPC Wiki carried complete sets of scans for various magazines, Computing with the Amstrad wasn't one of those magazines that had a complete run available, and it doesn't seem to be accessible anywhere in the Internet Archive at all, but all the other magazines that we use on the show are. So if you want to know where we get a lot of the information we use for the show, that's where. And if that's not a testament to the legacy of this magazine, I don't know what is. It's a real shame that an archive isn't available, because Computing with the Amstrad is decent enough to warrant it. It wasn't a standout title, but it was pretty good. A Prelude to Chaos was developed by Ego Trip, a well-known member of the CPC community who has a vast number of games under his belt these days, both on the CPC and other systems too. This game is an enhanced version of the ZX Spectrum original, which he also wrote. It's a top-down adventure collector mode that looks a lot like your standard 8 or 16-bit JRPG, and that's no bad thing. A Prelude to Chaos is the second game in the Adventures of Amy series, or it may actually be Episode 0, it depends on which way you're counting. Anyway, whichever way you go with it, this time Amy is trying to collect 50 power jewels and also disable a load of machines so she can stop an invasion by the nefarious cyborg queen as the game describes her. This is all done by wandering around a top-down map in true console action-adventure style. The game is very well drawn, very nicely animated and runs smoothly. It feels an awful lot like The Legend of Zelda, and it's a pleasure to play. Some of the puzzles can be a little bit tricky at times, and working out which spells to use here and there can be a bit of a pain at first, but do persevere, especially if you're into action-adventure games and classic-style RPGs, because there's a lot here to enjoy. The music on the title screen is great, but you'll find that it disappears when you're actually in the game. The game is quite silent when you play it, aside from a few sound effects here and there, such as when you're hit or when you fire a magic spell. But that's really not a problem, because you do actually get sucked into the game quite easily, and I did enjoy what I was playing. If I had one criticism of the game, it would be the colour choices. I know the CPC has a limited colour palette and most of it is made up of neon, and yes, this is running in mode 1, so it is only 4 colours that you can have at any time, but the background on some of these map areas is a little too bright for my liking, and then on other areas, it's a little bit too dark, and that can make the game hard to look at sometimes. It's nowhere near as bad as Panic Dizzy, but sometimes it can get a little bit eye straining. That's only a minor quibble though. The game is written in C, using CPC Telera, a modern game development kit that I will be discussing in more detail in a future episode. But for now, we can just say it's a very powerful tool, and it lets you make great games like this one. All in all, the game is really good fun, and I enjoyed playing it, so if you get the chance, give this one a try. It really is definitely worth your time. Another new game for 2018 is Galactic Tomb, a side-scrolling action platformer with a sci-fi theme and lots of hunting for places to open blocked passages. Graphically, it's impressive, and there's some nice scrolling going on here, which is sadly uncommon on the CPC. If this had come out back in the CPC's heyday, it would be seen as an absolute must-play game. Let's get the main issue out of the way right from the start. This game is super hard, and I do mean that. 
It's ferocious in its difficulty, and the enemies can take just one or two more shots to kill than you would like. Some of the timings on the lava that spits out on the ground can also be kind of frustrating, because you'll think it's safe to jump across the platform, and it won't be. Give it a try anyway, because once you get past all that, and you will get past it, the game is amazingly good fun. Graphically, it's luscious. This is the CPC firing on all cylinders. It has bright colours, bold layouts, and lovely designs. The whole thing pops with a character that will make it an instant classic. Some of the animations could do with a little bit of tweaking. There's pretty much no animation to the main character when he's jumping, for example, which ends up looking just a bit weird. But on the whole, this is polished and brilliantly presented. The music is amazing, and I do mean that. It's the music that gives the game the finesse that it has. In many games, a good soundtrack enhances the experience, but here, it's essential to the game. Don't play this without the soundtrack. You will be missing out on a huge part of the feel of the whole thing, and I really do mean that. And you'll need the sound turned up, because without the death noise, you may not notice that you've lost a life. The game just keeps on going when you die, so it can come as quite a shock when you run out of lives. This year, we have seen three absolute standout classics arrive on the CPC. Shadows of Sergoth, which we reviewed in Episode 4, and Dawn of Colonel, which we reviewed in Episode 6. Now, we have added Galactic Tomb to that list. These three represent the Amstrad CPC at its peak, and they are all incredibly strong contenders for Game of the Year 2018. Which will win? Well, there's still a CPC retro dev competition to come as of the time of writing this section, and we may see some more fantastic entries pop up from there, but for now we've got a very close contest for the prize, and Galactic Tomb is right up there with a strong fighting chance. And that's all we've got time for this episode. I'm really sorry it took so long to get it out to you. I'm hopeful that we can get back to a monthly schedule from now on. In the meantime, I've created a short text-based choose-your-own-adventure game, so now that you've finished watching this episode, you can give that a try to keep you entertained until the next one arrives. There are several ways to die in this game, but there is only one way to succeed. Can you find it? This game is available from the CPC Wiki for free, and the link is in the description box. So, until next time, happy computing!